You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Do you know what's going on in the futures options market? If not, don't worry. You tuned into the right show. We're here to help you. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from this fine network upon which you're listening to this program right now. If you haven't done so already, remember, make sure you upgrade to the full network wherever you're getting this show. It could be iTunes. could be Spotify. could be Stitcher. Could be our app. If you got the app, you got everything, so you're good there. <laughs> but our website, uh, make sure you're checking them all out because a lot of shows hit the network these days for you guys across the broad spectrum of options related products and a few other things. We talked hard assets on the interview show, diamonds, and other things not too long ago, talking crypto, a lot of other things making their way onto the network these days to continue answering the questions you guys keep hitting us up with all the time, which are many and varied, and we welcome them all. Keep them coming. No matter how you're listening to the show. And of course, keep those reviews coming too to help the folks continue to discover the programs in these trying times. And I'm joined once again on the old program by my friend, my cohort, my compatriot in all things equity volatility, at least. Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Sean, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. I am here. There he is. All right. Welcome to TWIFO this week, sir. It has been too long. Thank you so much. It's been a week, and it's good to be back. We've had uh, we've had some. We, we continue to be busy, and the markets continue to be busier. It has been a week. It's funny how that works, huh? This weekend show how it tends to be every week. But a lot has happened in your neck of the woods. We'll get to all the the movement and the shaking and all the fun stuff in a second. But you, I know you were pretty busy earlier this week as well because you had the big the big webinar, the big joint soiree with a CME and Cbo and your folks from FTSE. I know you were thrust. 
somewhat unwillingly into the, into the hosting role that I usually play out there. So, so walk us through that really quickly. How did it go? What were some of the big topics you guys discussed uh, on, on the session? What were some of the interesting points you heard from the presenters? And maybe any interesting takeaways you came away from the webinar with, sir, you want to share with our audience? Well, let's, uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about the subject of the webinar. The, the subject was U.S. small caps volatility and the global pandemic. And it was, we hosted, FTSE Russell hosted, and we had guest speakers. Our first guest speaker, speaker was a, a gentleman named Stephen DeSanctis, equity strategist in small and mid caps from uh, Jeffries. Fantastic, fantastic guest. Gave a, 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 a tremendous uh, presentation. We had our friend, yours and mine, Tim McCourt, Global Head of Equities and Alternative Investments at CME Group. We also had Kevin Davitt, who is a senior educator for the, for the CBO education uh, program at CBO Global. And I have to tell you, all three of them just did a phenomenal job. Uh, some, of, some of the interesting tidbits were uh, uh, Stephen DeSanctis' presentation on exactly some of the things we talk about in terms of the economy and how small caps coming out of recessions – uh, beat large caps uh, the majority of the time, how there's uh, key indicators uh, to what makes those move. Um, he talked about value versus growth um, in, in, the, in the Russell 1 and the Russell 2000. So uh, all of his examples were large caps versus small. And, you know, there's a Russell 1000 future and a Russell 2000 future at CME Group. So just to, uh, uh, as I say, small caps and large caps, the Russell 1000s, the large cap, the the Russell 2000, the small cap. So I'll just continue to say small and large cap. But he, he just did a fantastic job in comparison of, in historical times, what causes small caps to trade um, more volatile uh, to large caps. Um, a historical look at that and how small caps outperform in, in various scenarios. Uh, the big one is in during recession times, uh, how small caps outperform meaning um, – the Russell 2000 outperforms the Russell 1000 um, on a historical basis uh, due to its ability to come out of recessions uh, quicker. The fact is they are, you know, more domestic and can react faster to um, financial incentives and uh, relief coming from various uh, regular, uh, from, from uh, the market, from, uh, from regulators, so uh, domestic stocks historically have done uh, better. The question is, and it was a big question, was when is this recession going to end? When is this pandemic going to uh, peak? And when is it going to start improving? So there's obviously, there's been some testimony this week, which has really caused some volatility in the market. And uh, up until then, uh, you had Russell 2000 outperforming uh, large caps uh, for several, several days. And, of course, after uh, Fauci's uh, uh, testimony this week, Russell 2000 outperformed to the downside. Again, bringing, back, bringing us back to that point of volatility uh, in the Russell 2000 being uh, – the, the 2000 being a more volatile index. Um, next was Tim McCord, who talked about being able to take advantage of those trading opportunities using Russell uh, 1 and 2000 futures – uh, I think we, we, he didn't focus on one at all. He, he might have brought it up uh, because of the comparison Stephen did. Uh, but Russell 2000 Futures, uh, the ability to trade micros, which just uh, announced their one-year anniversary last week, talked about that, talked about liquidity in the product, talked about uh, um, its success and the ability to trade those products, um, the fact that uh, micros have a, a, a real global reach, a, a – uh, uh, an institutional base that is now uh, trading the product as well, um, and uh, all the segments of the market trading the product. So it's, uh, it was a fantastic presentation by Tim McCourt. And then we had Kevin Davitt uh, from CBO Global, who literally lit up the webinar uh, with just excitement in uh, uh, quoting a couple of movies uh, that, um, that were historical name and just really energetic and, and full of information in regards to trading options and having choices and, and being able to manage that risk with all types of different trading strategies. And he didn't talk about specific trading strategies, but he talked about enough trading strategies 
to 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 really really give you that that overall picture that there's an opportunity to trade Russell 2000 RUT options at SIBO, enhance your portfolio performance, um, equitize and uh, be able to hedge your risk. And three, being able to take a, a position, a directional position, if and when you want to. So I think Kevin Davitt knocked it out of the park as well. I just did all three of the uh, presenters and it was really enjoyable. We got uh, some some great questions um, that we went back and forth on with uh, the listeners. We had uh, a, a tremendous turnout. Over you know, over a couple hundred people were on live, so it was uh, a really good um, uh, discussion. And I, I think clients, all the clients that listen, got a lot out of it. Well, since we're talking about underperformance and volatility in equities, before we get into the movers and shakers and everything, I just want to hit on this because you're right. There's a lot of research hitting this right now. You guys did your webinar, and I'm curious. By the way, is there a link to that? That can people? Is there a recording of that, Sean? There is, and I will send you that link so that you can you can uh, listen to it. I, you know, it just happened, so I don't know if that link is up and running, but I will get that to you so you can push that out to your clients. Yeah, well, we'll definitely do that, and we'll also make sure be like we like on demand content here. Uh, on the old network, we'll make sure to push it out to you folks. If you are interested in having that, uh, you could check it out. Maybe we'll see if we could uh, actually copy it over to the network. That'd be kind of fun. So our subscribers could get access to it. But uh, maybe a little bit of a bonus for you folks out there. But we're talking volatility and small caps. I don't want to get away with that because it is moving again. In fact, spoiler alert, when we get to the movie shakers in a little bit, E-mini is going to be, Russell is going to be number, number two to the dark side, off over 6%. Since our last show, 6.15%. In fact, come into showtime right now. We're seeing the RVX at about a 50 and a quarter, which is the VIX of the Russell 2000. That's up over eight points from last show. And the VIX itself, we're at about a 35, 35.3 or so. That puts it up about four points from our last show. And that spread at nearly 15 points. Remember when Rick Rosenthal was on from the SIBO just a few weeks ago, he said it kind of maxed out around 14. We're at a 15 right now. Listen, that kind of shows you what rarefied air we are in from a small cap volatility versus large cap perspective. It's been so interesting. In fact, the folks, our buddy over there, Mr. Eric Norland, by the way, you guys can find all this, of course, see me group.com slash twifo for the show. If you want to get some of the research, like this just hit in the presses before showtime uh, from Eric and his team over there at CME. He did a lot of deep dive into this because this clearly was causing him to scratch his head and say, hmm, as well. He, he put out a paper called Why Large Caps Have Done Better than small caps recently, and he's breaking down a lot of data. I encourage you to check it out for yourselves, listeners. It's very lengthy. A lot of great details. And I'm just going to kind of break down a few, a few nuggets over this because he, he talks about the first four months of 2020, which is what uh, Sean was just talking about as well, when we've seen small caps effectively underperform large caps by about 15%. And that's kind of contrary to a lot of popular wisdom about small caps that they should be somewhat insulated from these larger macro shocks out there because they're not doing the same thing that the large caps are that make them more prone to things like currency risk and international trade issues and things like that. Uh, But again, the pandemic has had a broad reach. So it breaks down by a number of different segments. Since 1979, the S&P 500, Russell 2000 have had similar performances. He says prior to 2020, small caps often outperformed during periods of economic distress, which is Exactly what we find ourselves in right now. And then he, he has a couple of different scenarios where he breaks this down. From 79 to 82, there was very bad inflation. The Russell 2000 did much better than the S&P by 76%. From 1990 to 93, Russell 2000 did better than by 48%. That was a period of recession there as well. From 1999 to 2013, uh, the, S&P, excuse me, the Russell 2000 rose by 114%. That in a period that included the annihilation of the tech names in uh, 2000 and, of course, 9-11, 2001, uh, a bunch of other things going on. That, of course, included the global financial crisis. So Russell 2000 blowing the doors off from that perspective. And then now we fast forward to now and we're seeing large caps uh, doing a little bit better. Uh, they usually have outperformed during periods of economic expansion. So that would make sense. Why Maybe over the recent years. As we've seen the market doing well, the economy expanding, why maybe large caps have outperformed. He highlights a couple of periods here as well. 83 to 1990, during the boom of the 80s, S&P outperformed by about 91%. 1994 to 99, again, the dot-com explosion, S&P outperformed by 92%. And, of course, the most recent bull market, 2013 to 2020, we saw the S&P outperformed by about 29% over that same period. And so that makes it, again, even Eric says, it's curious 
why small caps are lagging right now in 2020, a period where they're normally outperforming. So he tried a number of different reasons for why that is. And one of them I thought was kind of interesting because we're talking about volatility right now. He says a lot of people point to the weighting. Let's get to the weighting first. Because people have mentioned the weighting. The Russell 2000 has much lower weight to tech versus the Russell. Well, this is the S&P, of course, and other large cap indices. It also has a higher weight to financial services, healthcare, and other sectors that have underperformed of late. So a lot of people have been pointing to the weighting. So in general, they have a higher percentage of healthcare and financial services, a lower weight to IT, and IT has done better. Financial services, healthcare have done worse uh, right now. So that, that's one of the reasons people point to. But he actually looks at it and says, it doesn't seem to explain that because if you apply the rating of the Russell 1000 to the 2000 and you calculate the hypothetical performance of that index, it has similar performances. So in that sense, the, the difference in sector weightings, he says, only explains about 10% of that activity out there. So then something else must be afoot. He, he digs a little bit deeper and gets into what's going on from a vol perspective. And he compared what's going on with the VIX, which is the measure, of course, of large cap vol, and how the changes in the VIX impact things like the small cap out there, uh, which is, is very interesting. And he found on days when the VIX index rose, large caps tended to do better. And vice versa. So on a one-point rise on the VIX translated on average to a seven basis point underperformance in the Russell 2000 versus the Russell 1000. And that doesn't sound like much, but when, again, you're going from about 14 to about 85 in the VIX, like we saw recently, that could shave about 4.5% off the Russell 2000 versus the large caps. Again, that's not going to account for all the underperformance we've seen. It only accounts for another maybe 10 or so percent of it. So there still are other factors lurking out there. But still, a couple of interesting bits of analysis. Again, I encourage you listeners, if you haven't done so, Eric and his team do great stuff over there, cmegroup.com. It should be on the homepage. Eric's stuff's usually front and center there. If you're interested in all things volatility and how they impact large caps versus small caps, you're listening to a show like this, so you probably are. Uh, then it's a great lengthy article, a lot of great visuals to break this down. Sean, this is kind of dovetailing what you were just talking about with your webinar. Have you had a chance to see Eric's kind of lengthy research into this space and what are your thoughts of his his different ideas for potential reasons why small caps are lagging right now including a broad vix and its impact on small a lot to unpack there sean what are your thoughts there well i know eric norland he's incredibly brilliant and just does a phenomenal job and i could not have uh uh more more fantastic things to say to him he does such such good he's a great speaker too i i think he's been on your show a couple of times um really enjoy um, his work, his analysis. He's thorough. He gets it. Um, and he actually has really, really insightful things to say in regards to um, small caps versus large caps. And his analysis is uh, really interesting. There's so much of what he says is 100% accurate. And uh, um, I should say it's all accurate because he's, uh, he's really into statistics and movements and has just a great perspective on what has been moving the market. And when he says VIX has been driving the market, it's, you know, it, it, everything correlates when the markets get really volatile. Um, I think we even talked about VIX versus RVX in those initial coronavirus days, we're trading one-to-one -one, in a ratio, like side-by-side -side in terms of volatility. So I agree with him that uh, when the, the markets rock, uh, the the beta between uh, various indices goes to one, right? It makes all the sense in the world. So um, Eric, Eric's uh, put out a great paper and it just came out today. So um, I'm really looking forward to just, you know, I, I've, I've skimmed it over rather quickly. It, it literally just came out. So I'm looking forward to uh, diving into it and having some more conversations with him about we're, it. We're quick actors here on Twifo, hot off the presses right on out to the show. We don't waste time here. On Twifo, we get you in, we get you out, we get you some good data. Again, check out that paper, though, listeners. It's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. All the many hundreds of people who checked out the webinar over there this week probably want to check out this paper as well. But Sean, we got to keep on rolling. We could spend the whole day talking about ball and small caps, but we got to do our movers and shakers. I already gave one away, kind of uh, peering behind the curtain a little bit there. You know what I'm going to ask you now, sir? So, what are you feeling right now? Are you feeling light side or dark side to start our journey, sir? You know, the markets turn north. Well, you know, just before the show, so I'm going upside. I'm I'm, I'm just a, a half full guy, you know that. So we're going to stick with that today. 
You're right. We have seen a bit of the worm turning out there. Though perhaps it's turning again. S&P just went dark side off about a quarter percent. So it was off substantially uh, a lot, a lot big sell-offs yesterday in the broad equities. And then today it seemed like it was going to be a little bit of that again. And then we started rallying and everything was up. And now it looks like maybe it's uh, turning a little bit again. So again, wait five minutes if you don't like what's going on in the market. And you'll see something different out there. We'll start, let's start light side. I think you know the number one mover and shaker is. It's inescapable. But uh, iron ore, number five to the upside this week. Up nearly 4%, 3.98%. Number four, rough rice. That's been popping up there on the list a few times of late. Up about five and three quarters percent. Number three, heating oil. Up 8.91%. Number two, our old friend, Class 3 Milk. Blowing the doors off this week. Up 21.05%. That's still not enough to capture the number one overall most mover and shaker spot. And, of course, number one to the upside as well. That's our old friend, WTI. Up 22.63%. WTI just on the rampage. Over the 27 handle right now, looks like, out there. So just uh, crazy town out there. We were negative 40 not too long ago, now at 27. So, yeah, that's a nearly 70 handle swing in a few weeks, listeners. So a lot has been happening in WTI. Let's get to the dark side now. Number five to the dark side, feeder cattle off about four and three quarters percent. S&P mid cap 400, the only equity that can come even close to matching the Russell 2000 right now in terms of movement and volatility. S&P mid cap 400 off about five and a half percent. KC wheat off about 5.6 percent. Number two. The E-mini Russell 2000 off 6.15%. Number one to the dark side, lean hogs again this week. So a lot of interesting stuff to unpack. we got to start with uh, the number one uh, name that all you guys are really just uh, just fixated on. Can't get enough of. Either you love it, you hate it, you want to talk about it. It's, of course, crude. It's just been blowing the doors off out here this week. Again, as always, listeners, you guys can play along. Generate your own report for crude and whatever else you want. You want KC wheat? You want feeder cattle? Get on in there. It's semigroup.com slash twifo t-w-i-f-o if you do that head on over right now to the energy section choose wti we're going to begin our journey out there this week a lot of stuff popping off in wti we've seen perhaps again perhaps some of the storage fears are behind us i say that with a lot of trepidation because uh, looking at the numbers right now storage related concerns seem to ease somewhat we saw the inventories over there in Cushing, and everyone's talking about how important Cushing, Oklahoma suddenly became over the last few weeks. Everyone wanted to buy a place, perhaps with a pool, in Cushing, Oklahoma, so you could store some of your crude in your backyard. That's, of course, the delivery hub for WTI out there. That declined, the storage inventories declined by 3 million barrels last week, according to the EIA, falling to about 62, almost 62 and a half million barrels. If you're curious, their capacity is about 76 million barrels, so we're not at capacity anymore over there in Cushing, Oklahoma. So that at least perhaps is alleviating things a little bit. Also on the delivery side and the supply side, we're seeing uh, the number of active oil rigs in the U.S. hitting the lowest levels since 2009 out there. So threatening down the the oil rig rotary count, (laughs) threatening 200 almost to the downside down there. Not quite there yet, but looking at trending that way from its high back in 2014, it looks like about 1,600 here. So well shy of that. And again, so the supply mitigating a little bit, that also perhaps helping uh, some of that again. That said, though, that said, we did go negative last month, and the CFTC is coming out warning that there is a possibility. And again, we all know that, but now the CFTC is coming out and saying that, that uh, futures brokers and clearinghouses and exchanges, that they are preparing for the possibility that certain contracts may continue to experience extreme market volatility, low low liquidity, easy for me to say, and possibly negative pricing. That's coming out of the CFTC. I can't remember them in the past warning about negative, uh, at least in WTI. So this shows what kind of rarefied air we find ourselves in uh, right now. Again, they went out of the way. They're a regulator. They went out of the way to clarify. We're not suggesting or implying that it will go negative because that's what a regulator, the regulator can't talk about predictions. But they're saying the possibility is out there. So you folks out there need to pay attention. Of course, you saw IB most, uh, most infamously hit interactive brokers out there. They revised their loss to $104 million, I believe it was $88 million not too long ago on the whole negative crude oil debacle out there. So a lot to unpack. Let's unpack what's going on right now on the options front. WTI at a twenty-seven seventy. Right now, so feeling robust, feeling the love out there. That puts it up nearly 6% for the week and, of course, 
from our show last week out there. Looking at the vol, the vol is coming off a little bit as we're seeing maybe some of this rally. Again, it kind of depends what you're talking about with the vol. There are a few contracts that are spiking, but these are mostly in the weeklies, so I don't really count that as vol. The most active contract was actually out here in July. It was a July contract with nearly half of the paper, about 47% of the paper going up out here this week. And the vol in that contract was off about five handles. It's about a 22 and a half out there right now. So vol has come off. Look, look at the skew really quickly. The skew, the puts were about almost 8% rich. They had the money this week. They are richer. They are about nearly 13% rich. They had the money. So we're rallying. Folks may be getting a little bit concerned. As the CFTC putting out a warning about negative pricing, maybe not surprising that puts getting a little bit of love, but they're up hard. They're up to about 13% compared to about 8% last week. The calls were 4.7% cheap to the money last week. This week, they're about 11.5%. So calls coming in, puts getting bid. That's, that's working like a traditional equity index skew would work as you rally. You're seeing that usually that's how that would unfold, but it's playing out this way instead in WTI out here. This week, let's see what the hot trades were out here this week. Looks like the 20 strike was where the action was this week, at least out here in July. That gets you to the 20 puts, doing about 7,600 contracts. The lion's share today, 4,000 contracts of that 7,600 coming up today. Maybe that rear warning from the CFTC playing a little bit of a role. People saying, oh, maybe we need some puts. <laughs> CFTC says, we can we go negative again? Now, let's get ourselves some puts. Again, that's not in that contract, though. They're not expecting... That, uh, oh, yeah, I guess that technically that would be in, uh, in that contract out there. But still, interesting Interesting also seeing that, not seeing a ton of love for the weeklies. That's kind of par for the course out here. Uh, let's see, number two was the 10 puts actually out here in July. It was about 4,000. So, again, some folks who are concerned about the negative 10 puts. If you got, saw negative 40 last time, <laughs> 10 puts seems comparatively easy. In retrospect, then about 3,600 of the 30 calls. So there were some calls on the tape. The lion's share coming today, listeners, about 1,300 out there. Let's move on out a little bit farther to see if any other weird paper was lighting up the tape. 25 puts out here in September doing about maybe 3,000 contracts. And 20 puts here in Dees doing about 3,400. So 20 puts, if you're curious, where was the action out there? 20 puts in WTI out here. This week, we'll put that out there on the old Twitters for you guys, too, so you guys can follow along. Mr. Sean, I'll allow you to pick next. We have a lot of weird names lighting up our movers and shakers for this week. We talk a lot of crude on the show and and well-deserved. We talk a lot of small caps as well, also well-deserved because they're both moving and extremely volatile right now. But aside from that, which of these others in our our top ten to the upside or to the downside are catching your fancy? You want to sink our teeth into more this week, sir? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually thinking, you know, there's been so much about uh, inflation and uh, um, uh, cattle and hogs and all of this. So why don't we go with lean hogs today? Lean hogs. We can do that. It's number one to the dark side, off over 8.5% since our last show. If you want to find that one for yourselves, listeners, head on into the agriculture section of the TWIFO. That's where you're going to see that. Then go down, down to livestock. Not a place we get to that often, but it has been lighting it up this week. Skip over live cattle, even though that one's been moving as well. And let's get to the lean hogs out there this week. As we said, this is becoming more of an option story than we've seen in the past. I like to hit select all, but again, that's, that's up to you. Uh, for this one, it won't be that big of a deal. It's not like you're doing it in euro dollars where you'll see literally pages of contracts out there. Uh, let's see, about 38,000 contracts on the tape, a little bit more than that this week, which is pretty robust for lean hogs out there, nearly 12,000. Going up today, so pretty decent, uh, pretty decent activity out here this week. Let's get on out to what's going on out here. Lean hogs at a little bit shy of fifty nine right now, fifty eight, uh, about fifty eight, almost point nine out there. It's just shy of the sixty uh, fifty nine handle, I should say, out there. In case you don't follow lean hogs on a regular basis, and I wouldn't blame you. If you did, but this is an area that's also been under a lot of pressure of late. We're seeing COVID-19 impacting the food processing plants. The CEO of Tyson Foods coming out saying, hey, our system is broken. We're having problems. They're trying to mitigate the costs as a result of the spiraling demand, but also nothing can get out to the people. The supply is broken down. We haven't talked before about having to liquidate and euthanize hogs out there. It's a, it's a disaster out there on the, uh, on the hog front out here. So coming off a little bit this week, maybe that's a little bit of a sign of some of these measures 
are, are taking hold. We're not seeing the catastrophic price increases some feared as a result of this. Uh, Vol also, interestingly enough, coming off quite a bit. That front contract out there has about 30 days to go, almost about 29 days to go. And the Vol has come in quite a bit, about 10 and a quarter, per, 10 and a quarter points, actually, not percent points. Uh, out there that's still at about a 64 and a half so it's still a very volatile contract we were talking a 22 and a half or so from an implied ball perspective on wti Let's give you some frame of reference this is almost 3x out here and about a 62 and a half for the next the july contract out there so pretty volatile stuff out here in hogland which again is kind of warranted giving the headlines we're seeing out there. The number one contract is that front contract with about 29 days to go. That gets you out to June, listeners. It's about 55.5% of the paper, so pretty much lighting it up out here this week. And let's look at the skew out here really quickly. About 6.1% rich were the puts last week. This week, getting a little bit richer, which, again, we've come off a wee bit, so not surprising. They're almost 14% rich to the at the money this week. So puts getting some love. Calls were effectively even to at the money last week, which is... Kind of interesting. If you come from an equity index background, that's going to be surprising to you. Getting calls even, not a, not a thing you get often. But in the commodity space, it's not quite as rare. This week, they have come in now. They're about 12% cheap. So some folks hitting those calls, bidding up those puts out there in the front month, at least, in the old lean hogs. What was the big print out here? I said we had about a, almost 59 handle out here. It was the 50 puts leading the dance, which what is pretty active for lean hogs, about 3,500 contracts, the big day, kind of a tie between yesterday and today. Today about 1,250, yesterday about 1,250. The line, the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. And a lot of that seems to be opening. Obviously, we don't have today's numbers. So opening 50 puts, that wouldn't surprise me, given the fact that we saw the puts getting a lot of love out there from a skew perspective. That would imply as well that folks are bidding up these puts. So folks are buying 50 puts in the front month in hogs, Maybe a sign that the, the worst of the crisis has mitigated somewhat, and perhaps we'll see a bit of a retreat to more normal prices out there. That's good for you folks out there shopping in the grocery store, or getting stuff delivered to you as well. No one wants to pay 3x for, for a meat product during a pandemic out there right now. So fascinating stuff out there in all things Lean Hog. Mr. Sean, I will allow you to be the dictator of the show once again. We talked... The E-mini Russell 2000, we talked WTI, we even talked a little bit of lean hogs. But there's a lot of stuff, a lot of different stuff lighting it up out here this week, which is kind of fun. By the way, listeners, our movers and shakers this week is pretty evenly split between the upside and downside. Not, not a thing we've seen a lot of late. Usually it's heavily biased in one direction or the other. This week, a little bit more of a split market, which makes it kind of interesting as well. So, Mr. Sean, where should we turn our eye next, sir? Uh, since we've already had a, a phenomenal discussion about uh, Russell 2000 and, and small caps versus large caps, we can't go there. So um, that is something you don't know about me. And, and my background is very big in the dairy industry. So why don't we go with uh, with uh, dairy? Why don't we go with milk? In the dairy quite industry? A, quite a mover this week. Are you secretly an Oberweiss, sir? What, what is your background in the dairy, sir? My, uh, my father was an executive for a, a very large dairy company for many, many years here in the Midwest, a company called Dean Foods. I think everyone that listens to the show is familiar with Dean Foods and uh, their ice cream and their milk and uh, a, lot of, a lot of products. Uh, uh, fantastic company. My dad spent the majority of his uh, executive career uh, uh, on the labor side, labor negotiating and governmental affairs for Dean Foods for many, many years. A company that I believe had some early problems even before the pandemic hit earlier this year. Didn't they, didn't they fire for Chapter 11? Uh, they did. I, uh, yes, they did. That uh, that was that was interesting news. Um, it's been uh, it's been a long time, uh, and Dean's was bought years ago by a, 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 a company based out of Dallas called Suiza, and they they just kept the brand, uh, Dean Foods. But uh, so the the headquarters moved down to Dallas out of Franklin Park, where Dean Foods originally was from. Perhaps a bit of a canary in the coal mine of what's been going on out here in the dairy space of late. We talked about it before. Dairy has been active in Class Three milk. Is number two. It's it's second only to WTI this week in terms of movers and shakers, up twenty one point oh five percent since our last show, listeners. So, Class Three Milk. We've said it before. It has been extremely volatile. Again, I encourage you, our friends over there at T three, 
They've been on some of our other programs of late. They have a milkshake index that is, does measure dairy volatility. Now, I said it doesn't measure the, uh, the, the ones listed here in the U.S. I think it's mostly out of the Anzac region, but that is the leading dairy-producing region, which I have since discovered from talking to those folks. <laughs> so if you want to see what's going on out there, that's an interesting index, and maybe we can get uh, CME to follow suit with some sort of dairy volatility. That would be certainly would be something uh, to watch because it certainly merits it this week. It's blown the doors off just about everything else. From a net movement perspective, coming into showtime, we're seeing, again, by the way, you can find this over there on the drop down for yourselves, listeners. Head on into the ags, get into dairy, and then class three milk is where we're heading this week. And this one, in previous years, wasn't a big option story. That is starting to change out here as well. All this volatility has to translate into something, right? And it's translating into more volume. 14,300 contracts on the tape. That's a far cry from what it was not too long ago out there. So the volume is starting to trickle in there, or I should say really explode in out there in Class 3 milk of late. If you're not one who follows such things a very uh, very rigorously, the Class 3 milk, that front future is at about a 12 and a half right now. So that will give you a little bit of a, of a sense of where we're looking out there. That gets you out to the May contract. May still floating around out there in Class 3 milk. That's got about 19 days to go, but the action this week was out in the June contract that has about 47 days to go. That's about a, a little more than a third of the paper went up out there. Now, again, we're not talking crazy size out here in Class Three Milk, but before we get to the volume, let's talk about the skew. That's where let's go out to this June contract. The puts were get this, listeners. The puts were 21.9 percent cheap <laughs> to the at the money last week. That is extremely. Extremely cheap. This week, they have swung completely and gone the other way. They are now 5% rich to the at the money. So effectively a 27-point swing in the puts. So yeah, there's some vol to be had out here and some skew movement as well out here in these contracts. Again, by the way, this, this week, that contract is up. That we're looking here in June, the June contract. That future is up. Almost almost eighteen percent just this week alone. So that's been a good run out there. The June contract is at about a about a looks like about a sixteen ten out here. So a little bit more than the May contract. The May contract at about twelve and a half. The June contract at about a sixteen. So a little bit of a little bit extra premium going a month out or so in the class three milk. Let's get to the skew. I said with the calls were these numbers are just leave off the page, listeners. The calls were thirty eight point four percent rich to the at the money last week. This week. They are 1.3% cheap. So the calls have come all the way in, 38.5%, and then gone another 1.3% beyond that. The puts have come all the way back and then some. So this is just extraordinary levels of skew change out here just in the past week, listener. This is kind of somewhat unprecedented out here. Again, a little bit thinly, more thinly traded name, so you might expect a little bit of that. It's not, you're not talking seeing this in the, in the E-mini or in the Euro dollars, but still. Extraordinary changes out here in SKU, which is probably attracting some of this paper as a result. The big print out here, we're at a 12 and a half in that front contract in the, uh, in the June future. It's about a 16. We're still seeing the 12 quarter puts. It's like they're leading the dance out here this week. That's a big print in June with about a whopping 384 contracts. Not a ton, and almost all of that coming on Tuesday, 335 of that 384. So you're going to see more staccato style paper in a name like this listeners big chunks of big in air quotes big for this name going up as opposed to the steady stream of paper out here again that's going to be responsible for some of the big swings we're seeing out there in the skew as a result but it is more active let's look really quickly after that after the 12 quarter puts we've got 14 half puts with about 375 contracts then 13 even puts 283 then the 16 calls 279 and then the 17 calls, 269. Those are the big prints out here. Also worth noting, actually, it looks like the 17 calls in September also sneaking in there with about 325 out there. So interesting even number of strikes, mostly dominating that out there. Uh, interesting volatility out here in all things Class 3 milk. So again, dairy, not a place people have been talking about a lot, but that's starting to change. Not a place people have been trading in a lot. That is also changing out here. So, and it's also on our movers and shakers every week. It is definitely leading the dance most weeks. And this week, second only to WTI, which has been on fire of late. So if you're looking for a product category, maybe has a little bit more vol and has a growing 
options liquidity to boot, then you could do worse right now than Class 3 Milk. And we could do worse than hearing from you guys. So without further ado, let's get to a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to your segment. The whole show is your show, but this is where you guys take the reins with your questions, your comments. We did a deep dive into your questions last week. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I'd like to make sure I save some time for you guys here on the show. You guys have a lot of questions. Also, you have a lot of thoughts. We asked you guys last week, we were talking about equity volatility and equities earlier. We asked you, just in general, how are you feeling? We took the bellwether. Everyone looks at the S&P, and it had just passed 2,900 uh, to the upside at this time last week when we were asking you this. And we said, hey, what are you guys feeling? We had asked you a month ago when it passed 2,600 whether you were feeling robust about this recovery. Most of you faded it. Over two-thirds were fading that. Turns out we were over 2,900 a mile a month of change later. So we asked that same question again. Passing 2,900, how are you feeling about these levels? One month from now, where are we going to be? Higher, lower, about the same level, or you're just getting the heck to cash? And you guys still faded it, but by a lower percentage. You faded it to about 43% saying it's going to be lower a month from now. About 26.5% saying it's going to be higher, which is different than last time. And about 17.6% saying around this level. And a much higher 13%, more than double, saying you're in cash right now. That latter part, perhaps not as surprising. We have seen a nice recovery. So some of you may be taking those assets off the table while this near-term madness shakes itself out. Mr. Sean, are you surprised that our audience out here... Uh, is fading the recent recovery out here in equities, or is that kind of what you're hearing anecdotally from talking to the folks out there and the trading firms and the brokers as well, sir? You know, it's uh, it's a mix, just like there's a, a bid and an ask in the market, right? So um, you, you, you have uh, people that are optimistic, you have people that are cautious, and you have people that are pessimistic. So it's a blend, uh, uh, depending on who you talk to. But I think all of that uh, um, leans towards everyone wanting this to come to an end. So, Yeah, unfortunately, the most recent data and the comments out of the White House, maybe not leaning into that perception. But I should say, as speaking of perceptions, looks like the market's back in the green again. So, <laughs> and everything is up now. Not, NASDAQ was off before and everything else was around. Now everything is green again. So again, wait five minutes when it comes to the equities, at least, and you get something completely different. Speaking of equities, Sean, we had an interesting comment from N3Cat. I remember last show, we were, a lot of people have asked us about Russell Recon. Uh, there was an interesting article, uh, Bank of America, saying they expect a Russell, excuse me, a record-breaking Russell Reconstitution. N3 Cat shared that with us and said they think opportunity is knocking. So they're interested in this. Um, let me just pull some nuggets from this article, Sean, then you could chime in. Uh, they, Bank of America says they expect record-breaking changes post-COVID-19 when it comes to the big recon, which is coming up in about a month. Uh, The February to March sell-off and the subsequent rally driven by COVID-19 has significantly reshaped the equity markets, and the turnover in the recon will likely be higher than usual. They point out the speculators and arbitrageurs, my favorite words, often buy stocks ahead of the changes. So some of those dates in the equities, they expect the changes occur earlier than uh, June 26, which is the actual date. And uh, the preliminary list of indexes, which was May 8th, that was in the the listing, the rank day, I've seen that's already happened out here. But of course, they said this comes in the mid of backdrop of high volatility. The Russell 1000 growth index is expected to skew toward mega cap stocks now more than ever. And the number of stops in the growth index is expected to plunge to a record 421 from 533 last time. While the value index is likely to see membership rise to an all-time high of 843 from 721, this Bank of America analyst said. And they see industrials will see a, a broad rotation out of growth into value. So, Sean, sounds like Bank of America thinking 
this is going to be a rock'em sock'em recon out here. And it sounds like N3Cat is agreeing, saying they're seeing some opportunity knocking out here. What are your thoughts on what Bank of America has to say, and as well as our listener thinking this might be an opportunity? Well, there's you know there's um, there's always opportunity in the market, and the and our Russell 1000 and Russell 2000 and the recon is uh, happening as planned. Um, as you know, uh, ranking happened in, in this month in May. Right, so May eighth was ranking day, but uh, the coming Fridays, uh, June fifth, twelfth, nineteenth, and then twenty uh, sixth are all big days as well, where there's communication and updates uh, uh, regarding uh, our reconstitution. So there's plenty of communication to the market as to what we're doing, um, the the stocks that are going to be in the indices, and then everything culminates on that Friday, the twenty sixth, at the close where everybody talks about that big day of, uh, of the transaction of the movement of the stocks. So I, I, I think we're in for an exciting uh, recon uh, a period here in June, and I think we're in for a, a, a fantastic number on June 26. I think this is going to be certainly one of the more exciting recons in recent memory. So even if you haven't paid attention to the past listeners, at least Bank of America and N3Cat and myself – I think it's going to be an interesting one to watch, so uh, pay attention at the very least. Uh, last week, Options Game wrote in. He wanted to know, is there a difference between buying a future and two calls with a 50% delta versus buying a straddle? I kind of explained that that wasn't really – you're kind of just doubling down there. I think he probably typed it wrong. <laughs> uh, and we did talk a little bit about exposure on strikes, though, which, and uh, he wrote in this week. He said he, he did write it wrong. He said, last time I, I meant to ask about selling a future versus buying to 50% Delta calls. Uh, anyway, I didn't think about the per strike as market makers do. That's good to know. Well, yeah, you know, that's interesting. You, you, you must, that makes a little bit more sense now compared to you. Last time you're saying you're buying a future and buying two calls. So you were just really super excited about the upside uh, going forward. What you're talking about now is a little bit different. That's kind of what I was an alluding to last week, which is, of course, the Delta neutral type position, which is what you would have on here. Of course, you're buying two calls with a 50 delta. You're hedging it with the future. So that would effectively be a delta neutral position out there, which has indeed some similarities to what you're talking about here, which is buying a straddle. Straddle, of course, listeners, two at-the-money options, a call and a put on the same strike. You can think about it. If you own a call and you own a put, which, no matter which way the underlying moves, as long as it gets there pretty quickly, that's the caveat everyone forgets to mention. As long as it gets there pretty quickly, you're doing all right with that position. Usually it doesn't. It kind of meanders around that strike for a while, and you see both that call and that put erode very quickly, and that's the danger of straddles. But what you're talking about here, option game, buying the position on that strike and then hedging it. So by delta neutralist, we mean like you're talking about. You're taking the equivalent delta and then selling it in the marketplace so you've eliminated now the directional component. Now, what do you have left over? You have effectively a vega position, a volatility position. So what you want in that scenario is volatility to explode. That is your ideal scenario out there. And you can also do a couple other things. What we used to do a lot in the markets whenever on the floor when we had positions analogous to this, and we had – you're going to have now listeners because you're buying, you're buying two calls. You're going to have a long gamma position. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. So this is – this is all new terminology to you listeners. I make sure you check out our Options Boot Camp program. It's a good place to start. A lot of you are loving that show. It's back weekly as well as Options Playbook Radio. We'll cover this in a lot more detail. Effectively, you're long gamma now. So what that means is on this position where you're long two calls and short a future, as you rally, that gamma means you're going to get long deltas. As you drop, you're going to get short deltas. That's what just basic definition of long gamma. So what we usually tend to do is gamma scalp that. So you could, as you rally, maybe you sell some futures against some maybe partials, smaller minis against that as you get long deltas to capture that delta. And as it drops back, hopefully you can recapture that. So this position gives you an opportunity to do that and delta hedge it and scalp it the way you would a, a long straddle. So from that perspective, it, there are some analogies there. Again, it depends. Just getting long a straddle or just getting long this position, I think you need to do something else against it. And that's where it comes into question how effectively you delta hedge is going to show you how well this position pays off. Very rarely do you just buy a position like this, either the calls with the delta hedge with the future or a straddle, and it just explodes in your favor in one direction or the other, and you make a ton of money. That's what people anticipate putting these on. Very rarely does it work out that way. So what really is going to matter is what you do in that in-between scenario to try to offset 
In your case, you got two calls as well, so you're going to be paying time decay there as well. So what you're going to do to offset that time decay while you're waiting for that big move, that's going to be your gamma scalping. That's really going to make the difference between, I think, most of the, most of the time, how these positions pay off. And those rare scenarios, and we are in that rarefied air right now, we're seeing big moves. So you could put that on, just hope for the best and swing for the fences. But you're probably going to want to do a little bit more due diligence. And in that scenario, you're going to have similar setups there uh, from the straddle and how you delta hedge that going forward. Again, your long gamma there as well. So you're going to get long deltas to the upside. A straddle can also have a little bit of residual delta, depending on how things are going on in and of itself. Uh, so you could have a residual delta to the straddle as you're putting it on. I know it sounds weird, both 50 delta. Uh, you could have some interesting scenarios there as well, one positive, one negative. They should cancel each other out, but straddles can have a delta. So that you don't say exactly how far out you're trading these, and that's usually where you start to see those deltas emerge. But a lot, a lot to unpack there. We could spend the rest of the show on this. But, yeah, you have a scenario. They are analogous in that perspective and how you delta hedge them going forward, how you should say really how you gamma hedge that, how you gamma scalp that is probably going to make the difference between how that plays off. And you can look at that now because you have delta hedge that you can look at that as a net position on a strike, which is what I was talking about earlier, which is how market makers and professionals tend to look at that. Good question, as always, Mr. or perhaps Mrs. Options Game. We don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's coming from YouTube, Sean. Get a lot more love on the YouTubes these days. I think folks are just liking having an additional outlet to get access to the show. This comes from Extra Calls. I like the handle. Extra Calls. They're chiming, chiming in on episode 197, which is a few weeks ago, which we called a maelstrom of small caps, hogs, and crude. Actually, we could call that today's episode as well. We hit on similar stuff. Uh, Extra Calls just saying they loved it. Well, we love you every, and everyone else who's listening out there via the old tubes and every other way. Keep it up out there. Uh, let's see. Mally. Mally Boom. <laughs> I like that. That might be my handle of the week there. Mally Boom. They're talking about, we were just talking about lean hogs earlier, Sean. They were chiming in about a, an article that said, positive news in the pig business, but still many concerns. <laughs> Love the punsters in our audience. They chimed in and said, that sounds like hogwash. There you go. Sean, are you a fan of the legion of punsters lurking in our audience, sir, like Malaboom and others? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love, I love the, the connotation. Um, but, uh, and I love uh, all comments from your, from your listeners. And it's just great to, to get feedback, it, funny or constructive or um, uh, the questions as well. The, the questions have been fantastic. So keep them coming, everyone. And keep the comments coming. Really appreciate them. Here's another one coming. Comes from just Tim. Maybe it's our buddy Tim McCourt. Maybe he feels bad he couldn't join us on the show today. He was scheduled recently. The folks at CME obviously having to do a lot of moving and shaking over there themselves. We'll get him back on the show soon, listeners, uh, to fill that CME group hop seat. In the meantime, someone named Tim, maybe it's Tim McCourt, <laughs> chiming in. He wants to know, what do you think will happen to options when the trading floors come back? It's an interesting question, Sean. You and I have discussed it on the show in the past. A lot of people expected when everything went electronic extreme disasters in uh, the broad equity markets and a lot of other products as well. We didn't quite see that, though. We did see extremely wide spreads and a lot of thin markets as a result. Uh, I'm curious, Sean, they're talking about reopening dates. I believe CME has uh, a given one and CBO is talking about it or maybe vice versa. We have seen a date from one of them out there. So it does seem like in the near future, we will see floors resume in some capacity. What are you hearing from talking to the trading firms out there? And what are you expecting, Sean, going forward to options when the trading floors come back? I think, uh, I think the market will embrace improved liquidity. Uh, complex transactions are still, still difficult to do electronically. So I think uh, those that are high touch clients that need that, that, that speci- specificity in, in transactions are going to welcome being able to talk to their brokers and being able to uh, get that price discovery in the open outcry environment. And I actually think that uh, um, it's going to be good to have the, uh, the options uh, for us open back up again. I think the market's going to welcome it. Yeah. Especially for what you're doing out there, Sean, on the equities, on the equity side, you know, we see a lot of the high touch in that neck of the woods, certainly also, you know, Euro dollars and the other big products out there where there's, a lot of complex orders being quoted, a lot of you know spreads, multi-leg ratio type spreads uh, going up. Those are just logistically hard to quote on an electronic environment. And it's easy to pick up a phone and just get that quoted in the pit out there. And there is certainly a, still a substantial 
segment of the audience. You know, Sebo mentioned this on their earnings call as well. They're trying to get that back because they're hearing from that side of the audience that they want to be able to do that complex stuff again in a much more easy to execute format. And the pit provides it. So at least for a lot of the equities out there, there still is a demand on the on the pit trading floor presence. So I think Tim, I agree with Sean. I think it's going to be interesting to see. I think we'll see a lot of that complex paper come roaring back. It's still getting done out there, but the look at the ADVs in most of the products out there in the broad equities, you'll see that has dropped uh, quite a bit of light. Some of that has to do with volatility coming in. We all know vol translates to volume, uh, but also I think of late there's just been a, a, a spillover effect of the lack of being able to do some of those large complex orders and just the difficulty of doing them has been felt in the volume. So I think we'll see that coming back, hopefully. See some tighter spreads out there as well and a little bit more displayed size on the bid offer now that there are folks literally standing behind those again. So hopefully we will see that, Tim. Hopefully that will be the the sign of a, a great resurgence, at least from an overall volume perspective, in the equity options markets going forward. All right. That music, unfortunately. Sean, an hour flies by. When we're talking lean hogs <laughs> and WTI and answering listener questions and all the other fun stuff we do here on Twifo. Glad you guys could join us this week, every Thursday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. is how you find us. You can get us live there or you guess after the fact, wherever you find your favorite podcast. We're going to be talking a lot of crude these days going forward. We're going to be talking a lot of equities, a lot of volume, both of those. Trying to mix in some other complexes. That are seeing a lot of surprising love. Also trying to mix in a lot of you guys out there. If you have a complex you'd like us to talk about, you know where to find us. At Options on most of the major social media platforms. TheOptionsInsider.com. You can leave your feedback there. Questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. That also works. Or join the live chat. Get bumped to the top of the queue. That's a good place to go there as well. Mr. Sean, speaking of going, before we go, if folks want to check out that webinar recording, where should they go? What should they do? And then... Uh, what else is up your sleeve over there in the land of footsie, sir, now that you're coming on down from the high of the webinar? Please email me at smithfootsie at footsierussell.com, and I will get you to the to the webinar. It will be posted on our website, footsierussell.com. There's actually an idea page. There is actually a reference to it on our website already. So if you go to the front page of footsierussell.com, you'll see it referred to there with some some nice discussion and also a little bit of the bios of, of the three fantastic presenters we had. So go to footsierussell.com and, uh, and mark your, your website. We'll have it very soon as well. So um, we'll have it in several places. You'll also find it at cmegroup.com, and you'll find it on Jeffrey's website as well. So it'll be, it'll be all over the place for people to view. But, uh, uh, again, you know, we've got lots of things going on. We've got the, we're still celebrating the, the uh, anniversary of the micros and the success that we have personally seen in the Russell 2000 micros at CME Group. We couldn't be happier with uh, that launch being, again, CME's most successful product launch in their history. But um, also, we've got recon coming. So there's going to be lots for us to talk about in the coming weeks. And I look forward to doing that here with you, Mark. Yeah, folks are excited about recon. Does seem it's going to be quite the recon to pay attention to. So stay tuned. This show, listeners. We'll do a deep dive into all that fun. fun. I forgot the name of the listener who chimed in about it. Many of you have chimed in about Recon of late, so we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on you guys for all your questions going forward. Glad to see you guys are enjoying the show and getting a lot out of it, hopefully. If you like what you're hearing, make sure you leave a review on your platform of choice so that others can continue to discover this program and all the other ones we do during these somewhat trying times out there. But don't worry, we're not done yet. Maybe if you're listening live, we'll give you a little fun stuff to enjoy after this show. And then we'll be back tomorrow live, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, via the old volatility views. And then, of course, kick it off again on Monday with the option block. And then we're back again on Thursday for the option block again. And, of course, a little more this week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. 
CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.